Well, thank you all for being here. Thank you for coming down so alphabetically. It really <laughs> makes me happy. Um, so just to, just, uh, I just want to say a little out front as kind of like, I don't know if it's a disclaimer, but just to kind of talk about the parameters a little bit. This is not meant to be uh, a scholarly or definitive history of queer cinema. This is not meant to be, you know, giving you some sort of linear history of gay film. I think partly that's because there really is no such thing. I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of talk right now about whether or not Stonewall really should be thought of as a de the demarcation point in, in gay history. And I, I also feel like with gay film history, there really is no beginning or end. And one of the things that, um, that I'm trying to do with that column is to think about how queerness has always existed, just like gay people, queer people have always existed. Queerness has always existed within film. It's always been there. It's always, there are currents, there are um, desires, things that course through film history. And it's more interesting to kind of go back and look through and see where those things exist rather than treat gay cinema like it's a genre. It's not a genre. Um, God bless you. Ah, okay. well, I'm glad you agree. Um, so, ooh, there's even applause for that. What, I couldn't quite figure out where to start because as I said, there is no start and there is no end. Um, so I happened upon this. And I think it's a really good way to start. This is my Entertainment Weekly, September 1995, the gay 90s entertainment comes out of the closet issue. Um, this was an extremely important thing to me. I was in high school and you can even see my name and my address. I'm not gonna tell you the address because you, you'll all go find the house and, bother my mom, but um, I mean, this is really an incredible thing. And I only discovered a couple years ago that Mark Harris, one of our panelists, was actually responsible for this issue, which was extremely important to me um, as a teenager. So I'd like to hear a little bit to start from Mark about how this came about and a little background on the reception and um, you know, what, maybe if there was any sure. blowback. Sure, well, so it was 1995. Um, obviously, I was eight uh, when I did it, and um, it was uh, Entertainment Weekly was then published by Time Inc. And um, this was the first. I mean, we had always covered um, LGBT entertainment. The first cover of the magazine ever was Katie Lang, and I, in fact, remember Regis Philbin at the launch party for the magazine, looking at a big blow up and saying, "I don't know who the hell he is." Um, so we had a long way to go uh, to, to get to this, this issue, and it came up, uh, a, another uh, writer at the magazine, Jess Cagle, and I uh, pitched it as, as a kind of combined moment of more and more um, LGBT content, uh, making it into... Uh, not just movies and TV, but commercials, posters, ads, rock videos. Um, but also, aside from that, things with a gay sensibility that were suddenly um, making their way into mainstream culture in an only semi-encoded way. I mean, one of the little picture chips on that cover is um, uh, Batman and Robin, <laughs> uh, the, the third of the original uh, series of Batman movies, and I think it was the first one with Robin in it. There's also Timon and Pumbaa from The Lion King on here. <laughs> I just want to point out, right. for those who can't see. There, there, I mean, it, it was, it, we, we were trying to play a little bit with, with how, um, how mainstream, uh, and I know this is a sort of dirty word in, in cultural and general politics right now, but um, how in an incrementalist way, uh, gay culture was becoming more accepted either explicitly or subversively uh, in mainstream entertainment. And um, we, we were the only two sort of senior gay people at the magazine and 1995 was just at the point when higher ups knew they were not allowed to say like, gross, that's disgusting, don't do that, we hate that. Um, but not, they weren't quite at the point where they were saying, yes, we should definitely do that. So everything in the magazine was lobbied for, down to, I have to say, um, the letters to the editor about it, um, where we, we really wanted as a precondition that 
for a long time, whenever you did something gay on the cover of a mainstream magazine, there would be two letters about it three weeks later. One was like, I enjoyed this piece so much, and the other was like, gay people are bad. I mean, the, the one thing we really wanted to fight was that like the mere existence of uh, gay stuff in entertainment should no longer be a subject of debate. Like, to, to, to just move the Overton window a little bit away from, like, gay people, should they exist or not, and toward the, you know... And, right, exactly. And, and so, I mean, it, it just occurred to me when I was looking at the, this issue that, you know, there are some things that are the same, there are many things that are different, and one of the different things is that that, at least, is no longer uh, a, a point of argument. Well, one, one thing that's in there, and we're, we'll obviously move on from this, though we could talk about it forever. <laughs> there's, a, there's a poll that was taken. It's like a, a, a kind of a reader's poll, a general reader's poll about people's attitudes towards homosexuality. It's, it's a very shocking snapshot looking at it from today's... I, I remember reading it at the time and not thinking it was shocking. It's shocking now because we think so much has changed. But it's like 60% of the people think there were t like too many gay people on television in 1995. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really crazy. And who were, who, who were those people, though? Th those people are the... Not the people who answered the poll, but the people on TV. Who were they even watching? There, there were probably like three... And those were three too many. Right, well, like, th there was also, you know, Smithers from The Simpsons, who was not explicitly gay. Like, you know, obviously when you grow up, um, or I don't think it's as true now, but when you grow up watching, uh, when you grow up gay and you're looking for uh, gay entertainment, you're looking for anything that might be gay. Like, especially in the 70s or 80s, it's like, okay, this isn't gay, but does it seem gay? Does it seem like it might be made by a gay person? Is there something in the sensibility that is is secretly communicating to me? That was what you had to look for really um, because if you just head counted the gay characters or the gay movies you, you know you'd run out of them before you got to your second hand well I mean well that's what I wanted to um, segue into because of the absence the lack of visibility for so long of actual gay characters gay themes gay films queer people for many years were looking for signs of, signs of queerness in other ways so I'm curious about everyone on the panel what was that kind of, that moment when, when you were younger, when you kind of finally felt that sense of queer self-recognition or recognition with something that you saw on screen, whether that was film or TV? I must start. <laughs> because my answer is really perverse. Uh, it was 1985, I was a teenager, and there was a movie called Agnes of God. Oh yes, yes. Meg Tilly. Jane Fonda. Excuse me. <laughs> this is my woman's journey. Don't step on it. Today of all days, Michael. <laughs> As I was saying before I was interrupted by the patriarchy. 1985, I am a teenager beginning to have feelings that I cannot make sense of. So there's that happening. Also at this time, I'm starting to go to the movies by myself, which I could do quite easily because my parents' house in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, we were very close to this movie theater that was detached from the Colonial Park Mall, where I also spent, spent a lot of time. And so one afternoon, fall afternoon, if I'm remembering correctly, I took myself to see the aforementioned Agnes of God. And I was absolutely besotted with Meg Tilly, which is really crazy because I don't know if any of you remember this not very good film, but <laughs> Meg Tilly <laughs> plays She's the best thing in it. <laughs> yes, Patriarch, are you gonna interrupt me too? <laughs> she plays this nun who murders her baby, which she says she gave birth to. It was an immaculate conception. Jane Fonda plays the psychiatrist who visits her at the nunnery in Montreal or Quebec, I can't remember what. But I had to keep seeing this movie. I had to keep returning over and over and over again. And I still could not make sense of what was compelling me to return. I mean, I had a vague notion. I knew it was wrong. So wrong, in fact, that I would have to lie to my parents and say, oh, I'm going to the library, which quite conveniently was located 
very close to the movie theater of the Colonial Park Mall. And so, but there was something about this absolute ludicrous enchantment with Meg Tilly. I guess looking back on it now, I'm of two minds. I'm somewhat ashamed that my crush was on Meg Tilly and not the far more superior Jane Fonda, that would come later. <laughs> but I also kind of embraced the fact that my, <laughs> the object of my lust, it's so wrong. Perhaps that's the queerest thing about me. Perhaps it's the queerest thing that will be discussed at this panel tonight. <laughs> so yes, I, very, I quite specifically date uh, not just a, a hunger for movies, uh, but to, to this very pivotal screening re and repeat viewing of Agnes of God, T to like a growth of my, the, the, the bud of my cinephilia, but also the bud of other pleasures. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that validation. It means a lot. First of all, I want it on the record that I did not interrupt Melissa, and I am yes. a woke AF. Um, a true les ally. <laughs> like, Michael, when you asked this, I have to say, I, it took me, I, I so wanted to give you a story that was not erotic, which meant discarding my first 1500, you know, well, there was Brad Pitt's ass in Midnight Express, and there was Dustin Hoffman's ass in Marathon Man, and there was the time some guy touched my ass in Fassbinder's Quirrell, and then said, well, if you didn't want me to do it, what are you doing here? Um, Why do you think we don't want to hear these stories? <laughs> they're for the, the, you know, film comment after dark portion of the panel. <laughs> but the, 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 I think the honest answer I can give you is that in... Uh, New York, there used to be this thing called the 430 movie. I grew up in New York, and there's this thing on Channel 7 called the 430 movie, which was old movies always shown in two parts, like Monday, Tuesday, then there was a very short movie on Wednesday, and then there was another movie Thursday, Friday. And they were cut to pieces and um, split just down the middle and padded out with commercials because they weren't that long. And... Um, they, I remember watching Whatever Happened to Baby Jane on the 430 movie, and also this Joan Crawford, Cliff Robertson movie called Autumn Leaves. Mm. And I, I knew, I felt like incredibly connected to them. Like th this, this idea of women in extremity, like th just this, this, this kind of over, amped passion and fury and feeling and sensibility that I did not see um, in the women, the adult women in my life, which were basically like my mom and my homeroom teacher. Um, <laughs> and and I, I don't remember what it was, but like I sort of knew that these were movies that as a boy I was not supposed to be watching and digging, that they weren't, you know, The Great Escape or, or um, Ben Hur or or the War Wagon or any any of the kind of movies that my brother liked um, and I I don't think it was a sexual feeling but I think it was a queer feeling if that makes sense it was like this movie is different from other stuff I've seen and I am different from other boys I know because I like it and I'm connecting to it somehow um, and I couldn't I think back then have put more of a name to it than that but it was definitely like something stirred, mm -hmm. you know. Something that wasn't supposed to appeal to you, but did. Yeah, it was, yeah. I, I mean, in a way, Meg Tilly in a nun's costume was, for me, Betty Davis in white caked <laughs> makeup. Like, I shouldn't be attracted to this, but I am. <laughs> uh, I guess there's two answers to, to the question for me. Like, I... Okay, the first answer, I mean, the first answer is not so much like when is the first, to answer your, there's like, obviously there's two ways to answer the question. One is like the, the time or the moment that you saw something on a screen that you, that just spoke to you without having any language or like um, orientation in which to install it, right? And those things are usually happening pre-sexually, but are not, asexual so 
my thing that goes into that category is is the first Superman movie, mm. which used to came on ABC one night, and I can distinctly remember I I was probably five or six because my my dad had just left and we had just moved back in to the house because you know my mother wanted to be respectful about my father packing his things to leave and um, she let me stay up to watch Superman and this there's a scene where let where I'll, I'll where Gene Hackman has applied the kryptonite necklace to Christopher Reeve and I believe that Valerie Perrine has come to the pool where he's lying with this, this kryptonite is, this is necklace. Back to me. <laughs> and trying to like, she's struggling with whether to turn to help Superman or whether to stay loyal to Lex Luthor. And I can remember thinking in that exact moment, I really want to be Valerie. I didn't know who she was. I wanted to be Miss Tessmacher. Um, and being so attracted to Christopher Reeve. I mean, it's not hard to do. I mean, I can find less obvious choices than Christopher Reeve. But I can, I can vividly remember just this visceral... It's I, I. It's just the most powerful want for another person without knowing what the hell that feeling was. Um, so yeah, that was. And every time I see that, it almost embarrasses me to watch it now because I go right back to that moment, <laughs> and I. It is completely involuntary. And I think actually that first Superman movie is actually very good. Um, but I also think that it is very personal in a way that. Is is mo not mortifying, but just to, to I've seen that moment since, and it's just like wow, that did a number on me. But it also shows how much you hold on to that shame that you feel as a child, right? That I didn't feel shame. shame at all. But you're you're saying you feel embarrassed and mortified oh, no. when you the think about it. The embarrassment is just the intensity that is still with me. I I didn't know to feel shame in that moment. It was amazing. I mean, I think I mean, depending on what everybody's formative sex moments are, I mean, I've had, I, that's just one of a lot, but that one was formative because I was alone when it was happening, basically, and I was very, very little, but I understood enough to know that I was attracted to whatever was happening in this moment, and there was something about the, like, Christ-likeness of that moment where, like, she is trying to figure out I mean, she winds up taking it off him and turning him back into powerful Superman again. But the, the thing that I responded to, because he's been in the suit the whole time, I was probably attracted to every aspect of Superman. But this particular moment of vulnerability and the, the struggle this woman has about which, which, which man she's going to help to, I don't know, I, that whole scene just really spoke to me. Anyway, and the movie, and this is important for, for Mark's, gay in the 90s issue, I worked at a movie theater for basically three years, summers and in high school, college summers and, and in high school. And I was there from, it was 92 to 95. And I just made a list. We can, we'll probably wind up going back to this later, but I'm just gonna do the, the movies that were playing at this movie theater that are still with me. Um, you lady, hold on to your armrest. <laughs> Uh, Claire of the Moon. Oh, I know. We we just lost Melissa. Is there an EMT? <laughs> you will agree that that's one of the worst movies ever made, correct? Yes, I will. Okay. Um, I watched the worst movie ever made eighteen times, probably. Um, Claire of the Moon, the incredibly true adventures of two girls in love. Mentioned Go that. fish. I'm gonna, I was gonna go in the order that I wrote this, but I'm gonna save this one for last because I wanna talk about it. Um, Wild Reads, mm. Wigstock, the movie, Jeffrey, The Crying Game, um, those are the ones I remembered from that period. And then this uh, AIDS musical called Zero Patients Woo! from Canada. 
Yep. I can still sing the songs from that movie. Um, Please do. Like Scheherazade. Uh, the theme song, which was like five, four, three, two, one, zero patient. Um, anyway, it, it was crazy. It was, a, it was an AIDS musical from Canada about patient zero. Anyway, it's, it, is, it is probably bad, but it was visually amazing, and I was 17. What, do I, what did I know? It really, really spoke to me. Um, but, but the movie that was the first, the first thing that I saw that, that like, I was like, oh yeah, I'm, I understand this person and this world and this story was Wild Reads. That was the movie, Andre Teshine's Wild Reads from 1995. Um, it, it was about teenagers, they were in school. I was in a boarding school like the two kids in this movie and one kid has a crush on another kid and the other kid is just conflicted about how much he wants to reciprocate the attraction. I don't know. That really, really stayed with me and, and made Andre Teshine one of my favorite directors despite everything. I feel like boarding school dramas are really fertile for same-sex yep. yep. eroticism. Like It's always a great ground for, yeah. for a little homo. I went homo. to an all-boys school for a little <laughs> while, so that extra super-duper spot. <laughs> I, I feel like we've we've talked about this question before, and I always st I've started to think of it in two broad categories, and one of which is like broadly about arousal, one of which is broadly about identity and self-identifying, and I think those two things can overlap, which is one of the fun things about uh, queerness. Um, but like so broadly, in the first category, though I didn't recognize it at the time, when I was seven or eight, um, we got cable for the first time, which meant that. Um, uh, my family had access suddenly to Nickelodeon and MTV and my twin passions were um, Clarissa from Clarissa Explains It All <laughs> um, because she would like she would tear up her clothes and she invented her own video games and she was like very honestly disinterested in men like she mm. there were repeated episodes where she was like I guess I could go out with my best friend but it just seems extremely boring and I was like yeah girl it does um, <laughs> and then <laughs> and then uh, on the MTV side, um, the Chris Isaac video. <laughs> oh, <my laughs> Wait, it's Wicked Game, right? Wicked Game. I, I think and, everybody had that, right? And again, I think like, you know, at the time, and for a long time, it was difficult for me to understand like what it was about the video, like what I was watching versus the voice and the, the, the maleness or femaleness of it. But I remember that every single time it came on, and because it was still a time before you could... Um, control or have agency over when you watched these things. You couldn't go to YouTube. I would like wait for it, <laughs> like have MTV running. And when it came on, I would just sit there slack jawed and like watch, you know, this like beautiful <laughs> model <laughs> roll around on the beach and it was this like black and white, very 90s like CK1 advertisement aesthetic. Um, it's think a Herb Ritz video, I, yeah. I believe. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, um, and I think it, it's, it's the combination of like the longing in his voice and seeing her as the image and sort of um, um, starting to, to feel a projection into that longing regardless of the gender of the speaker. It's just like pure, it sounds like a restrained orgasm in song form. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the, the identification side, which I've, I've, I've thought about more recently, I think because I think, um, there's a lot more and more interesting uh, conversation around gender identity that I, I, was, uh, I did not have access to um, as a younger person. Um, but the first time I saw Purple Rain, mm. <laughs> um, and, and, and like that, that genre of human, and it's like, it like gla glam rock, androgynous, transcends gender men. But like um, Prince, I was like obsessed with, um, um, uh, Velvet Underground, or sorry, Velvet Goldmine, and um, Hedwig and the Angry Inch, and David Bowie, and um, I, I, again, it took me longer to understand, like, I think it had this effect on me to feel that that one could be this sort of human, and that I actually, um, despite um, being very uh, physically feminine, um, like, I really identify with this kind of, like, soft mask energy, um, and that I wanted to be that, like, swaggering, like harnessing a feminine energy rock star. Mm. Um, and then for, I think in Purple Rain in particular, it's not, it, it, it is Prince. Prince is this shining star, but also like I became obsessed with all of the revolution. So like Wendy and Lucy from the band, you know, in, in interviews since Prince's death, um, they've talked about how they considered 
considered him a male lesbian, which I find really interesting. Like, there was just something about the, the dynamic of the whole group that, was, that felt like um, open in a way that I had never seen um, yeah. on screen before. Um, I, I, I'm so interested that you brought up this, this tension between identity um, uh, and, and con I, I don't want to misuse the arousal. other word. You, uh, 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 ad identity and arousal. I was going to say identity and connection because I, I think so much of the discussion that we have now is uh, about identity and representation is I want to see myself on screen. And uh, it's partly a generational thing because uh, like for me, seeing myself on screen was not an option, but I, I, I want to point out that there's like you can have a deep, deep feeling, not by seeing yourself on screen, but by seeing something that makes you want to be on screen. And like, and for me, this this goes as far back and as cheesily back as like when I was a very little kid and watched Batman, the original, like Adam West. Oh my like, god! I wanted to be Robin. Oh my like, god! Eartha I, Kitt in that show. I mean, and I, I took that show like. Dead serious, like not, no, I was six. No one explained camp to me. It was like a really suspenseful, scary show. But like, I wanted to be the cute boy who lived in the cave with that, you know, guy. And like, when when I was watching, we're gonna burn this afterwards, right? Um, what, like when I was would watch the Brady Bunch, I thought oh I thought like I want to be Bobby and have like you know, hot guys with perms roughhouse with me all the time. I was and, in love with Peter. And there, but, but you know, it, was it was never Peter. like, you know, I, oh, that's me. That's my story. And I thought of this uh, last year of all times when I was watching Love, Simon, which is, you know, the 950th, uh, you know, teen coming out movie now. And I sort of thought, oh, good. Like, I'm glad this is there because for somebody, this is going to be the movie where they say, I see myself, and I think that's a great option too. But first of all, there's a lot of there's a lot of different people, so you know, an awful lot of movies need to be made if everybody is going to see themselves. And hopefully, you know, we can teach young LGBT people as a subset of teaching young everyone to also take imaginative leaps into the movies they watch so that they can see themselves even when they have not explicitly been put on screen. And, and hopefully that there are so many, uh, such a breadth of expression that you don't just need Love, Simon to be the one film that speaks to everyone because it can't speak to everyone. It has a very limited exactly. perspective. It's an enjoyable film. It's great to know that there is like a John Hughes-esque film out there right. about and a kid coming out. Right, and someone will find their way into limited. it firsthand, but most people won't. Most, well, and most gay people won't. And it's so much about normalization. Right. And what's exciting is when you find something that's not about that one. That's about being, uh, not just being who you are, because that's what society says you have to be. Because that movie's all about a, like a very kind of upwardly mobile, you know, um, white queerness. Um, but that, you know, if, if there's something like Love, Simon, that's not about Simon. That would be really exciting. <laughs> but well, a, a film that I don't dislike, necessarily. And there have been, like... A, a zillion things I think like Love Simon that aren't Love Simon, but they're all, but they're they're as niche as Love Simon is. Uh, you know, Love Simon, but not from studios. Because it's about white queerness, had studio money behind it and and a right. wide release. Right. But there's never going to be one movie, and there shouldn't be, that is a universal point of identification for queer people. So. It, I feel like Orange Is the New Black is really working hard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, it offers you a lot of options, yeah. but... Um, <laughs> Collect them all. They're pretty. They're all there. Um, one of the things I, I really loved about the article, which I read today for the first time, um, is, uh, A, that you're very specifically focusing on mainstream, um, and that you point out, you know, that there's... Or you, you and Jeff point out that there's something you know, wonderful about the fact that people are more and more accepting of queer characters while also being pretty direct about the fact that that comes from the idea that it sells. I mean, there's a line in the article that says it's because homosexuality sells. And I think that is perhaps cynical, but true, and that there is a little bit of a parallel in some of the more mainstream queer characters that are in particularly like sort of teen box office hits right now, movies like Love, Simon, or 
even in Blockers, there's a lesbian character in Blockers. Um, you know, we talked about um, Booksmart. Booksmart, uh, which I actually think is pretty good. But um, yeah, there's it's 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 something that I struggle with because isn't ultimately what I want to see more queer people in mainstream representation. But then. I guess having no control over how it's done, the commodification of that, the, the, the mainstreaming of then queer culture, you know, works both ways, um, uh, can be frustrating. Right, I, I mean, I don't think the goal is to, to say like, I wanna see more queer people in mainstream entertainment, but a goal can be, I wanna see more mainstream entertainment acknowledge queer people. Like, that's not the goal for queer people, it's the goal for pop culture okay. and then queer people can have a whole set of different goals that that you know don't necessarily have to interface with uh, the commodification of, of gay culture or or of mainstream culture well I think in focusing specifically on films that have queer teen characters what I found most dispiriting about Love, Simon and Booksmart is that these are teenagers who are just absolute nullities. I don't care what the sexuality of any character in the film is. And not too long ago, I watched for the first time, I think Adrian Lyne directed it, Foxes, starring uh, Tatum O'Neill, Matt Dillon, and um, Kristen McNichol. And this is a really sexy, strange film. It is not a high masterpiece. I'm not gonna make the, the case for it. But there's something about, the, the film can appreciate the kind of feral energy of teenage mm -hmm. sex, sexuality. And I'm really not seeing that in many of the films centered on teenage characters of any sexuality, but specifically queer characters. The interesting thing, for me the most interesting thing about Booksmart is this extra filmic knowledge that Beanie Feldstein, who I think is an extremely charismatic performance, is IRL, queer, has a girlfriend, and of all of this ensemble cast in Booksmart, I think the, the, the sexiest scene is when her character is flirting with the vice president. That's really the only moment in the film where there seemed to be any kind of keen understanding of teenage pheromones. The, 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 the lesbian makeout scene in Booksmart just seems so programmatic. Like mm -hmm. it, those actresses could just barely figure out where to put body parts. I, I think that should be a real test for when you're casting these movies. Like you learn your lines and learn how to kiss the other person. I just never, or I just never believe, <laughs> I never believe, I mean, it doesn't matter what the orientation is, but especially when it's, when it's same, same gender. Yeah. I mean, learn your lines and learn how to kiss the other person should be a test for life. Again, yeah. Again, uh, listen, you know, buddy. <laughs> Amen. Well, I think to what you're saying, Melissa, I, I, I think what I'm getting at a little bit is that like it, when, uh, characters are explicitly queer in mainstream movies, and I know we're being pretty um, myopic in, in thinking about teen films only, but th it's almost as though um, uh, the team behind the film thinks like, well, great, we gave you your one quirky characteristic, they're gay, so like they have to be a nullity. Like everything else has to be as plain as possible in order for them to continue to be relatable to other people, quite explicitly so in Love, Simon, but it sounds like you know that's a little bit of what you're describing between the two lead characters in Booksmart as well, that like they, they have to tone down other characteristics as opposed to being a meaningful full person and also meaningfully queer as opposed to we ticked a box. But, but you know what, I think that's when, when everybody became so obsessed with this horrible word, relatability, I really, because again, thinking, thinking back on movies like Fast Times at Ridgemont High, a lot of these kids, they're obnoxious, they're despicable, but they are always interesting. Yeah. You know, they're not like paragons of virtue, they're not people you would necessarily want to model your, yourself after. Yeah. Although maybe, Jennifer They're magnetic. Recently. They are magnetic, there is a charisma. 
I'm not seeing that in Love, Simon. I'm not seeing that in 95% of the cast of Booksmart. Or um, another film that came out a few years ago, Edge of 17. Mm -hmm. These, I just feel like things are being sanded down. Yeah, yeah, there's a sanitization. And what's interesting is that you're seeing mostly queer characters only in teen films these days. I think that's partly because there are no adult characters in any film, and films are, are geared towards an infant, infantilized market. There are, just aren't adult characters. There are superheroes, and then there are teen films. So if there are no human, we've said this before, Mark, if there are no humans, how can you have gay people? Right. Um, but, but when you look at the adult films, that have gay characters, it's really pathetic, right? We have like the little, the little nugget given to us in Avengers Endgame, which is like in some sort of, I haven't seen it, but from what I've heard, there's, it's like in a therapy session, somebody says, oh, I'm gay, and I went on a date, and I don't know how. And it's but like, not the superhero, it's like a regular civilian after the end of the world. It's like... Played by one of the directors, because that was how he showed his, his um, allyship. And then there's, um, there was the Star Trek Beyond, which is a funny thing that Mark wrote about. There's that horrible, execrable Beauty and the Beast remake that has like a little gay uh, wink near the end. There's really nothing, which brings me to another question, and I'm sorry, I know you, there was something else you wanted to say, Wesley, I didn't mean to step on you. Um, has anything really changed since then, since 1995, with mainstream oh, yeah. films? Oh yeah, a ton, I would say. Um, the, the arguments we're having now are completely legitimate and, and we should keep arguing about it. We have a long way to go, but they are not the arguments that we were having in, in 1995. I mean, I, and I'm not saying by that, like, count your blessings, and I don't want to be the Love, Simon, or studio apologist, but, but I, I do want to point out this thing. I'm going to, like, plagiarize one of my own tweets by saying this, which is, like, maybe an all-time low in discourse, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, lately I've been sort of I, thinking about this in the context of Booksmart particularly. Like, I think we can sometimes fall into the trap of asking nothing of movies that do nothing and asking everything of movies that do something. Um, because there isn't enough representation, we can forget that for every movie like Booksmart, there are 10 studio movies that just do not acknowledge the existence of uh, LGBT people and easily could. So uh, there is this tension for me between movies that, yes, just check a box and feel like that is all the work that they have to do, and movies that don't even feel that they have to do that. Um, I think we should hold all of those movies to higher standards. Um, but to answer your question, no, I don't think this, that is a conversation that we would have had in um, 19... 95, and I'll just, uh, I'll say one thing that we were saying backstage beforehand, which is that five years later we did another gay issue, um, and this time we thought it would be really cool to list a hundred gay people in entertainment. As we were closing that issue, I was frantically phoning people in publishing at home at night saying, Hi, you don't know me, but I'm an editor in Entertainment Weekly. Are you gay? Because you seem to like edit a lot of gay books. I mean, it was an unbelievable uphill climb finding 100 people. And I'm not saying 100 famous people. I'm saying 100 people identifiable in entertainment who we could put on a list like that. And a lot of the people we asked, by the way, said, don't put me on that list. I don't want to be in some ghetto. I'll never get mainstream work if you say I'm gay. And I'm not talking about actors, you know. Uh, I'm talking about executives. Caterers. Right, <laughs> practically. We were pretty much down to caterers. I mean, it's, it's um, you know, it, it's a strange, so, so yeah, a lot, a lot has changed. There are conversations we're having now that, you know, the big conversation 20 and 25 years ago was if an actor comes out, can he play a romantic lead in a movie? The conversation now is there is no such thing as a romantic lead in a movie anymore because nothing that isn't a superhero movie gets made. So, it, so it, we can't really chart progress in a way. I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible to know if that argument would still be happening. We're charting progress, but we're charting it against a mainstream movie industry that in many ways has disintegrated and receded and gotten more cautious. Right. About, but, other, about things that have nothing to do with sexuality. Yes, but the change is that other countries, they don't want to take the chance that the movies that get shipped off to wherever they get shipped off to after they get made want to deal with a gay person. 
And I think that's, I mean, part of the sanding down that we're talking about, the reason there's no sex in any movies anymore, the reason that you would never make foxes now, is that they don't want to take the chance that, I don't want to name any specific country, but all those countries where the movies wind up, they don't want to deal with them being banned, having to censor some part of it that's already been shot and put into the, you know, it's just easier to just put people in capes and have them save the world. It, and I, I know that it's easy to sort of just go straight there, but if you think about the diet of things at once upon a time, just of which like superhero movies were a tiny part, a tiny but significant part, are now, you know, that's the whole meal. That's a, it's a major, major part of the whole meal. And that means there are all these things that would involve gayness, queerness, gender uh, expression that just can't happen because how in these worlds can they, well, that's not, not the how question isn't really useful because if you read the comic books that wind up becoming these movies, that shit is happening all the time. So there's really no source material excuse, right? But I, I mean, I don't know if that, I mean, I don't know if Melissa, I don't know what you were going to say when I raised my hand to, to. Well, I just feel this is, this is very difficult to measure because there's so much now from the past that is now available to any viewer who does not have to live in a major US city. Um, I mean, for those of us living in New York, we are incredibly spoiled and incredibly hashtag blessed because in the uh, 23 years that I've been living in New York, the, the repertory film culture in the city is, is the best it has ever been. So you can see things like a revival screening of Taxi Zoom Clothes, a German film that translates to Taxi to the Toilet. Or at the Quad right now, they're showing this incredible documentary from 1977, Gay USA. I mean, they're just, at Metrograph, they did this great queer 90s series. Uh, a couple years ago, here at the Film Society, Thomas Beard put together that incredible an early clue to the new direction, queer cinema or LGBTQ cinema before Stonewall. So, and then that's, I'm failing to mention films from other countries like Almodovar's Great Pain and Glory, wait, Pain and Glory, right? That'll be coming here in October. That again, even if you don't live in New York or Los Angeles or Chicago, you will eventually be able to see it. So I think, Yes, we could, what a, we, it, it's, it's easy to get very despondent over what's happening in big studio backed films. We are not gonna see a flourishing and efflorescence of multifaceted homosexualist characters. It's not really gonna happen. But I mean, you can, I know I always go back to this film. I hope, you, I hope you'll indulge me, but you can look at something like Mulholland Drive, which I happen to think is the greatest lesbian oh, love story Melissa, of all time. why are you doing this to us? Uh, but no, but I mean, this is not, you know, it was not marketed as a queer film, but yet I think it's one of the greatest ever made. So you're saying that just general access to all these great things, whether you're in New York or whether you're at home, mitigates the problem with what's going on in mainstream culture, and that maybe we shouldn't think yes, about mainstream there's, culture there's, the same you way have, anymore. You have more to watch. You have more to discover. You are not limited solely to this. You're not limited solely to Avengers. And one thing that also is different is that some of the subtext that Mark was talking about um, can now be made text when there's repertory revivals, when um, we have access to things via streaming services or whatever, the, the larger canon of queer or sort of unspokenly queer work. Um, as critics, we're, we're, we're able to bring that to the fore and a lot of the films that were programmed in um, the, the repertory screenings that you're describing probably would not have been considered explicitly queer films at the time. Um, it's somebody like digging them up and bringing that aspect um, um, to the light. Well, well that, and actually that brings me to uh, my next question, which I wanted to ask for, for everybody. Um, in writing about queer cinema, how much do you sort of let the subject speak for itself and how much do you bring kind of the eye 
into it? How do, you, how, do, how do you kind of negotiate identity, your own identity as a writer when writing about queer cinema? As a queer. Without saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is it something that you think just naturally happens? Because I feel like a lot of writing has become increasingly personal, whereas in the past I, fi I, I always felt just let it speak for itself, but the identity of the writer has to come through somehow. I don't really feel compelled to, to not be myself when I write something, but I don't really, I mean, it's important, but it's, n I'm not, it's, it's, it's important, but it's not essential. I guess is maybe the way to put it. I mean, it's, it would really depend on, I mean, it's entirely possible. It, it, I didn't review Moonlight, but there is, there's, there would be no necessary reason for me net to, to explicitly align myself with the experiences of the, of the characters in this movie, despite how much that movie might track my actual life or like, like you could sort of lay it over my actual life and it, it aligns. Um, and I wouldn't feel it would, you, I could write something that would get the job done without having to necessarily explicitly say like, as a, as a blah, blah, any, any, as a blah, blah, blah. Right. Uh, I mean, I'm not a big fan of the thousand word, you know, when I was eight personal roll up to the thing you're actually going to write about, which you then begin at word 1001. And when I was coming up as a journalist, that kind of writing was not an option. It's not to say I don't like personal writing, um, but it, it, it is to say that if I'm, if I'm writing culturally, critically, yeah, depending on the venue, I absolutely want people to know that I'm writing as a gay person about this particular subject. But, um, most of my writing is not um, primarily autobiographical or memoiristic, and and my my feeling about what um, people need to know about me in a piece is exactly as much as you need to appreciate what I'm trying to say, and no more. It's, so that's it, sort it's of my a, guy. It's a tricky thing, and I'm, I'm I'm. It's just I ask is it something that I'm kind of battling with to a certain extent like for example um the uh, i think that there's there's a dearth of trans writers out there and there's an increasing number of trans films and and tv shows and there's a marked difference when you read a piece that's informed written by a trans writer for uh, this film that came out last year that hopefully not a lot of people saw called girl <laughs> by uh, this oh. Belgian filmmaker. Oh. Did you see it? Oh, oh, yes. By Lucas, Lucas Don't, oh. the most perfect name for the filmmaker. <laughs> Just don't, everybody. Um, but it actually had, I think it won an award at Cannes. It, I saw it, it, got a standing ovation at TIFF. Um, but the best piece I read on it was written by a trans critic, Caden Mark Gardner. And there are some excellent trans critics out there. So it's one of those things where, you know, you, you do want a certain um, background when you're, well, that reading. you want. I mean, I think that that's important, but I don't, but it can't necessarily happen to the exclusion of other people writing about the thing, right? What you want is a wealth of voices and you want to know what people who, whose identities align with a particular film feel about it. Um, whether it's explicitly personal or autobiographical um, or a piece of criticism that happens to require the author's identity to advance an argument. Um, but I can, like, like, I wrote about Carol, for instance, Todd Haynes' Carol, um, and it was a movie that kind of just exasperated me, and I, I think it exasperated me as, a, I thought it exasperated me as a moviegoer, but then I was really thinking about like why is this movie getting on my nerves? And part of the thing that 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 irked me was that as a gay person, and and I kept a list of all the sort of all the movies. I wrote down all the movies that I watched when I was working at the movie theater. And then I wrote down all the movies that have come out like in the last four or five years, like the, the ones that came to mind immediately um, as 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 gay, queer, but not but explicitly, right? Not as subtext or like the, the identity versus identification mm -hmm. thing that we've kind of been talking about in the first part of this conversation. And they're all set in the past. A lot of them are like, they're, a lot of them are based on true stories or historically oriented. 
They are not set in the the movies that I mentioned at the big like you know at the movie theater. Uh, those were none of those were period pieces for the most part. Or they if they were like zero patience, it was done as contemporarily and as crazily as humanly possible. Um, and so. With Carol, I just also, I would never said as a gay man, but I mean, I think my exasperation with that movie was immediately legible as a gay person who would like the gay person who made this movie about these two women to maybe come back to the present. This is director Todd Haynes, who's like, I think has been living in the past for a long time. Not uselessly, but I also would like to know what this person feels about the present, and I think that movie for some reason for me was the last straw. And I don't think it was just be, just necessarily as a moviegoer, but it was a, I felt like a political act for me to say, Todd Haynes, come to 2017 or 2016 or whatever. I remember being on a panel on this very stage when Carol came out and having a little back and forth with you, and I'm still not over it about Carol. Sorry. How dare you? I, sorry to drag you back there. <laughs> I, I, for me, it's just the reverse. I just, oh, I'm sorry, Melissa. I just I wanted to make a point about Carol, but but, but, but go ahead. We can come. I'll come back to it if not here, <laughs> then out on the street. No, just do it. Just do it. No, no. I guess because I do disagree. I think one of one of the genius things that Todd Haynes does is yes, ostensibly it's set in the past. But I saw that film. I saw. I went to a press screening of it, and I ended up writing about it. I saw it the the day before gay marriage was made legal across the country. Uh, this is something that I have conflicted feelings about. And uh, there, was, there was a way that Carol, in this very sly way, kind of addressed what might be lost uh, when this desire becomes normalized. Mm -hmm. That I don't think was just an accident. I, I think Haynes is, is, is too intelligent a filmmaker to not, to not have been thinking about that. Oh, it's, it's, yes, I hear that. I mean, I also, and I agree. in the same way that, you know, I was talking about how being able to recontextualize history is, is really valuable. I think that that way of approaching historical subject matter and making the subjects explicitly queer um, is really valuable. It's like a, a go, getting to go back and have a fantasy version of the history that was completely like hi, like hidden or or if not hidden, muted. Um, and yeah, there's a bit of like wish fulfillment involved, but I but I think it doesn't bother me to have very various eras, if treated smartly, um, have have that um, have that brought in, have that story brought in. Okay, so not to rehash this for Michael. Sorry, buddy. But there is the, that one moment in the record shop where um, the... Uh, Therese Belovet. Yes. Played, played by my, my child bride, Rooney Mara. <laughs> that we can talk about after the panel. So Therese is shopping for some records, and she, the door opens. I think there's a little bell that ding-a-lings, and she looks up, and there are these two very tough lesbians looking at her and she feels their gaze. And all I wanted in that moment was to watch that movie in that moment. And that, that moment implied that, I mean, I guess because it's so smartly made, we're supposed to, and it believes that we know that that world exists in that moment and that it trusts us not to want to see it. But I've never seen that world in that moment and I would much rather watch this and this thing that I've seen, a, with all due respect to the intelligence with which that movie was made, a thousand times. But that movie, it's not Todd Haynes' fault that that movie doesn't also exist. Like, I'm not blaming him for that. <laughs> but he put the implication that it could exist in his movie. I'm not saying that, I, I'm just saying <laughs> I wanted something, I wanted something that he made me think I could have that he wasn't, that for the purposes of that film, weren't important to it. I appreciated that moment of longing. I felt like that kind I loved of moment. It. it was great. No, no, I know. When, when somebody walks into the room, you feel something. You don't know what it is. Their world is inaccessible to you. Even as a like burgeoning lesbian woman, she still can't get that or have that. I thought was really um, uh, important. And I, I think 
like, yes, I would also love for that film to exist, but, but you know, I think Mark's point rings true a little bit about the idea that, you know, a film that does some, what, what was your what was your Twitter self quote? Please tell us. Oh again. yeah, uh, uh, well I, I think the point is Wesley's wrong, um, <laughs> and I mean I I don't want to take a side about your vicious, monstrous, and unprovoked attack on this great movie, but um, the what I wanted to get back to just for a second was to say that I think I'm kind of the reverse of you in that I tend to foreground my being gay in a piece more when I'm writing about something that isn't gay. Like I, yeah. I, I always feel like talking about your identity is a form of self-credentialing in a piece, and I'm more likely to self-credential when I want to say, look at this mainstream thing that is either not dealing with gay stuff or dealing with it really badly. Uh -huh. Because like, I'm a white cis gay man writing about gay stuff. I, I'm not exactly like an exotic sea creature. There's like, a, we're a dime a dozen. So when, I, when I'm writing about like something gay, I almost don't feel like I need to say, you know, this is who I am first. But when I'm writing about something straight or mainstream or problematic or anti-gay, sometimes I do feel that it helps to like say who I am. Uh, oh, I had a great deal of fun doing that when I reviewed a film called Red Sparrow that came out last year <laughs> with Ms. Jennifer Lawrence. I wrote about it for four columns where my <laughs> wonderful colleagues let me uh, advance the lesbian supremacist agenda <laughs> twice a month, <laughs> as often as I can. and. Red Sparrow is a miserable film, but as Mark was saying, I thought this film may inadvertently, for sure, make the argument that heterosexuality is the most miserable, the most immiserating experience possible. So I think I ended up calling it like uh, that it was going to usher in the post-heterosexual era. <laughs> And, and to branch off that, I do want to leave a couple minutes for a couple, some questions because we've, we've gone over, no, no surprise. Um, this kind of circles back to my first question, but it branches right off of what you said. I really do think one of my queer coming out films was The War of the Roses. And I've only <laughs> recently realized this because there probably was no other film that I saw growing up. I saw it in the theater with my parents. We all went to see it as a family. That was all about kind of like the miserable kind of um, destitute uh, reality of heterosexuality. And those, sorry, here comes a spoiler, everybody. Those two people, that husband and wife, they die in the chandelier. They crash to the ground, they're dead, marriage is over. Yes, and but they, it's even worse than that. They willfully, I mean, they, they kill, they, they you know, kill, they kill themselves, they kill each other. Right. Yeah, and that really appealed to me. I was fascinated. <laughs> I, I love that movie too, and I did not understand exactly why until right now. I watched it for other purposes as recently as like six months ago, and I, that moment where he puts his hand on her shoulder and she flicks it off. Whoa! It's the, the final gesture yeah. of a studio comedy. Right. He's reaching out. They're at least in death. They they're will have in death, one right. final they're, gesture. They, the chandelier has fallen, and they're laying next to each other. And he puts his hand, she puts, he puts, As Michael Douglas dying. puts his hand on Kathleen Turner and she's just like, <laughs> you it's think like she's the, reaching out to grab it, but she knocks it off. It's the dark shadow of Thelma and Louise. It, it I is. will not hold your hand in death. It's this true. Is a, this yeah. is a poor yeah. choice because, to go yeah, into Because death. it's a man and a woman. <laughs> um, I do, I love straight people. <laughs> um, so do we have time for a couple questions. If anyone has any really good questions. Yes. Yeah, into the mic so we can have it for the podcast. Sorry. Um, so Melissa was talking about alternative options uh, besides mainstream superhero movies and, and whatnot uh, for LGBTQ cinema. Uh, and there are all these um, streaming sites as well. I mean, there are all these options on streaming sites. Uh, but the problem is that uh, queer cinema tends to get buried underneath 
uh, whatever is the original content that's on Hulu or on Netflix and whatnot if it's um, not being made by, by those things uh, or, or uh, streaming sites. And though there are um, specific or niche sites which Michael has written about like Deku and Reverie, um, those don't have the same sort of heft or visibility. So I guess my question to the entire panel is what, what is the option or, or um, how do we encourage younger people especially to seek out queer cinema of the past that is available on these sites or alternative means, there's stuff on YouTube. Yes, sorry. I mean, uh, this may be sentimentalizing, but I sort of think like, I don't know an LGBT consumer of pop culture who doesn't dig harder and deeper than the average person. Like you're almost trained from adolescence to I guess now the equivalent would be go past the home screen, look a little harder. Um, uh, I don't have a so like if you're if you're queer and you're interested in pop culture and you're not doing that, I don't know, work harder, you know, <laughs> like go for it. There's there's amazing content out there, and and I think I think once you know you have to look at it, you learn uh, look for it. You learn from a pretty early age to look for it. I agree with Mark. I have a I have a queer niece, and you know, there's not a week that goes by where she's not like, "How come you didn't tell me X Y Z?" And then sometimes it's not even. It's exactly the thing that you that that happened to all of us, which is that like sometimes the thing that I didn't tell her about was Grace Jones, right? And she finds Grace Jones, and she's just like, "That person is speaking to me." Grace Jones is not. She's she's a practicing heterosexual, but she is fucking queer and everything about Grace Jones met everything in my niece, right? So, I mean, I, and she did the work. I didn't say anything. She, I think they're, I think they're finding, I think they're finding all this stuff. I mean, it, we can talk about the quality of the thing. If you want, like, premium, that's a different story. But, like, I think it's so easy now to just, like, to just, I don't think it's hard to find. I feel, I feel the loneliness um, that that a lot of us probably felt at certain moments as as kids and adolescents. Um, it's not non-existent, obviously. You read the papers every day, you hear these horrible stories. But culturally, I do feel um, that it's not the desert that it used to be. Yeah, it's shocking to me that you can see gay stuff without having to leave your house. Like, that was just not a reality for me growing up. I know everyone you can is... can see it on the school bus. <laughs> just like, oh, there... You know. Right. And, and, you know, I've always felt... We've talked about it before. I've always felt that, you know, uh, gay people, queer people, th they find... They will find what they're looking for. We find what we're looking for. And, and you know, I had compared <laughs> the, like, the Deku and um, streaming channels that are, like, niche gay services... Um, you know, I compare those to like what T L A TLA video was in the '90s. You know, we found the T L A video catalog. They wouldn't hire we knew me. How to find them. They, they had a video. Like I'm from Philadelphia. They they did not want my job. I guess how I worked at the video store. I, my first choice was to work at T L A video, and in the in actual store. Anyway, sorry. I don't know. They're lost. They not hire you. That's no, shocking. Whatever. It's fine. Uh, another question. Yeah. As someone who basically probably fell in love with cinema in large part because of uh, Claire Denis in the 90s and basically having a love affair with Grégoire Collin and <sighs> him, him never knowing about it, uh, <sighs> and he still doesn't, but... He feels uh, that we can change that. I was at a festival once and I did see him and he's, he's, a, he's not the same as when... <laughs> Is no, but like an Olivier Olivier, which is the first time yeah, I ever I saw him that. at the movie theater where I was an usher saw that 15 times too. Oh I, I, I did too. Good um, God. And the Bo Trevi film comment cover, I'm sure, was a, I a, a her, sexual awakening for many people. I have her signed it right over his nipple. <laughs> anyway, um, but the point is, uh, I mean, one of the things that she does and now that she's a legend and everyone, like I, I feel like it's it goes without saying that she deals with desire like no one else. And I think it's a weird thing to be in a time when so many different f voices are, are finally getting a chance to make content, but desire is something that in large part has sort of fallen off the agenda. Yeah. I, I think because identity is sort of 
taken such hold. And the yeah. one thing that really I think a lot about is the fact that a lot of the films that we love that dealt with desire would never make it through the institutions that are funding the films, that are filling the gap, uh, that, you know, because filling the gap for dramas, let's say. Um, you know, when you think of like, I mean, what, what, you know, Sundance would never support like a year of 13 moons or, you know, I mean, I'm just saying that like, <laughs> I'm just saying, I, but I'm just saying this is a, this is a real thing. It's like, it's not, it, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to kind of get people, I don't know. Just we the, have, I don't know if there's I an think, audience. I, I don't know what's I, up. I hear exactly what you're saying and I think that what you what you're what you're identifying is in terms of the way this is a horrible thing to say in some ways because all of the political will that we have been fighting for in terms of the thing the words we use to describe whatever this moment is representation visibility equality they have superseded it's crazy, but it's true to some extent. They have superseded the depiction of reality, right? We are watching the most ideal versions of ourselves in a way that we can snap at and celebrate and feel good about. But at the end of the day, I just want to see in a year of 13 moons. And I don't care how bad or, or, or unhappy I'm going to be when I leave. I have watched something that is truly, deeply honest and real and somebody has taken a risk i mean we're talking i mean it it seems unfair to make it make it fassbender but whatever like there the risk i don't feel like i mean you guys can speak to this maybe better than i can because um i don't know why but you probably can uh but i don't do you, is there anybody that you feel is is taking risks in terms of the way all of the things kind of align. I have a controversial suggestion, but I'm more curious about... Who's your controversial suggestion? <sighs> Kashish. I'm not <laughs> saying... I'm not saying that it's... I'm not saying it's right, right? It's, it's foul and appalling. Anyway, sorry. I, I, re, I, re, I retract my suggestion. No, defend your suggestion. I don't have a defense for it. I just or threw explain, it out there. Explain. Well, I think the defense is, and I'm not defending him, but <laughs> he leads with horniness. And one thing is, and I happen to think his, his aesthetic of horniness is gross and monotonous, but... And banal. That yes, is the biggest ab crime. Absolutely. Right. But being horny itself for an artist... Is he not has a, a wait. I mean, I'm not saying no. Like, I, and 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 that that like desire, hotness, need, is getting a little short shrifted by a little filmmakers who are so interested in um, queer identity as a political statement that they forget sex. Yes. Um, no. That is going to dry up all of your gonads immediately. <laughs> but, but okay, yes, I am all for Do you hear my point? I, I, I don't want to talk about no, no. Kashish. I don't. But no. to, <laughs> to quote Southland late. Tales, teen horniness is not a crime. <laughs> but but I'm, I'm now thinking, and it's quite conveniently playing at Metrograph, if you, if you see something like Jack Kazan's incredible docufiction the David Hockney film, A Bigger Splash. That is a film that That's maybe- That's from 1974. No, but this is a film that is all about horniness. Yes. It is all about horn horniness. It's probably the queerest thing I've ever seen. But one thing that makes it even especially queer is that it's about not just Hockney and getting over the relationship with Peter Schlesinger, but it's about the larger constellation of people in his circle, some queer, some not. But this is a film that very much leads with horniness, but that is done with I don't know, respect for intelligence of human beings. What makes Kashish a cinema criminal, particularly in Blue is the Warmest Color, is just how idiotic it all is. Yes, 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 yes. I, I don't want to litigate the, the sexual politics of Kashish. But I'm not I even just talking about the politics. I'm just talking about the sheer... 
The representation of the sex, yes. No, I, not even that, but we, there's a whole, um, Leia Sidhu's character is an artist, and so we have to endure these interminable scenes of her talking about Rodin, and just the, 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 the stupidest bromides about the wait, artist's life. But Melissa, let's All take, of it, in total, right, but let's makes take, him. Let's take him off the table, right? Because right. the real question that I was trying to ask I, uh, I who was are the forced, great cinema centralists? Right. Who, well, not even today. Fuck great, fuck great, fuck great. Just who is putting sex in movies that is interesting, right? That also satisfies this other, like, real important concern about representation. Like, Soderbergh? No. Soderbergh? Say more, please. <laughs> Um, I think that, and I actually, just for a minute, not that I want to make the entire conversation about Kashish, but I have, I do, I have more mixed feelings about Blue is the Warmest Color specifically. One of the things I did appreciate about it is that I think that there is like a fundamental hunger, desire, drive that is part of it, even if it's not expressed well all the time. I don't think it functions well as a, as a depiction of lesbian romance. And I think that when, if you want it to be that, not you, but many, many, many other women that I spoke to, it fails miserably, but in some sort of like, like it's, it's actually an interesting example of what you're talking about because I think it doesn't function on the level of identity or representation, but does function on the level of like sheer horniness and how that can actually be a super meaningful part of your life and existence, that it like changed both of their lives, that hunger. Um, Soderbergh, uh, girlfriend experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, Magic Mike films mm -hmm. and the Candelabra, which are both yeah, very yeah, much yeah. central, particularly Magic Mike XXL, which I think was the most one of the greatest movies ever made. Period. <laughs> one of the period. One Everybody's of the most, agreeing. If not, Everyone's if not the yes. most feminist fil mainstream film of that year, and it centralized female desire uh, and its depictions of men actually decentralized their sexual desire, but their straight male friendships, which was very unique. And, and there's that great Les moment between Elizabeth Banks and oh, Jada Pinkett. Pinkett. Yeah. Oh. Yes. And it felt very real. That movie is it probably so is. good. It is. I mean, it, have you all seen it? Magic Mike XXL. <laughs> it, no, I'm serious. And it's the fucking Odyssey. It, it, it is these men. Are, you What? Nothing. Go speak. Uh. Speak. <laughs> No, I'm glad you're all happy. I, I, I really am. I, I want to say one thing, just because it's out of left field. Soderbergh is a good like, answer. Where I'm seeing maybe the future of what we want, what we're asking for here, is oddly enough in theater. I saw a couple of plays yeah. last year by this um, young uh, queer African American writer Jeremy named Jeremy Harris. Harris. Yeah. Um, he really gets it. Like, his, his plays are really interesting, they're really political, they're really provocative, and they're hot. And he understands hotness and desire and, and the charge of trans, transgressive sexuality as something that can be incorporated into like real, thoughtful, interesting art. Um, and it would be really exciting to me if playwrights were to lead you know, because so many playwrights end up in movies and TV anyway. If they start leading a, 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 a charge toward a kind of synthesis of the things we're talking about, like queer stuff with good politics and hot sex, I think that, you know, would, would be great news. Um, we don't really have much time left, but speaking of horniness um, not being a crime, <laughs> I wonder if I'm the only one on this panel who saw Magic Mike live and got a lap dance. Uh, you might be, because wow. my lap, my <laughs> lap is queen. still cold. <laughs> this is a true story. How? I think I would remember if that happened to me. You probably Why would. was there no blue was the warmest color live? <laughs> <laughs> I sense a branding opportunity. <laughs> we'll talk afterward. I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up there. Uh, thank you so much to my panelists. This was really fun, really great. Thanks for coming, by the way. Thank you.